Welcome back. So, um, in the last lecture, we arrived to define the concept of generating functional, which we call Z of G, of J, where J is the external source, arbitrary external source. And this was defined as the path integral over the field, uh, which we called phi, if I remember well. We set the inverse of the thermal energy kt uh, beta equal to 1, so we don't have to worry about beta for the moment. This is the internal Hamiltonian for the fields, and then there was a linear coupling dx j of x phi of x, which sometimes we call j capital dot phi for sake of simplicity. And now, given Given then j is an arbitrary function, given that j is the arbitrary function, z of j is a functional. It's a function of a function. And j, remember, is the external source. Now, our uh, major statement we made last time is that if you can solve for z of j given any j, then you have solved your theory. Why? Because from j you can compute any correlation function you possibly want by appropriate functional derivatives of the generating functional with respect to the field. For example, a three-point, just to give a different example, g1, x1, x2, and x3 can be obtained by taking negative d by dj at x1, d negative 1, negative 1, d by dj of x2, negative 1 d by dj of x3. Each of these terms will drop down one of these terms, 1 phi, on the generating function now. And then of course you want to compute thermal averages, and therefore you have to divide by the partition function, so we get 1 over z of g. And since we are typically interested in physical theories where there's no external source, unless we're specifically interested in magnetization in the presence of a specific magnetic field, in which case you set the j equal to the magnetic field you want. Uh, but this is a very specific case. Uh, one could think of different cases. Uh, maybe I'll give some other examples in quantum theory at the end of this lecture, if I have some time. But uh, uh, But nonetheless, Unless we're interested in very specific cases, at the end of the calculation, we set the, we set the, the source to zero. And graphically, we represented this operation of computing correlation function in the following way. We have a blob, and in this case, we get three points, x1, x2, and x3. Um, this, this graphic representation simply says that we are correlating the value of the fields in three points. And the fact that there is a correlation is, so to say, graphically represented by the fact that you can draw a line connecting all of these three points, showing that these three points are somehow intercorrelated. And normally the blood sometimes is, is shaded for reasons that will become clear later. Um, let me just anticipate that when you start developing third perturbation theory, then you start providing structure to this to this um, to this blob, for instance, by introducing objects like this, which which are called Feynman diagrams. But at the moment, the blob is whatever is inside. Uh, the partition function, the blob means compute the average within the full partition function, and in this sense, this is a non perturbative correlation or vertex. 
the, no, the name vertex come from the Feynman diagram notations that we will uh, that uh, that we will unleash later on, maybe in in tomorrow's lecture or next lecture or so. Uh, but at the moment, this is clearly non-perturbative by meaning that there is no perturbation theory involved. Uh, we just sum over all the, the fields in the pathological and imagine to be able to do the complete calculation. So, uh, this is very nice theoretically. But uh, in physics, unless you can really compute something, you don't have something. You have nothing in your hands. Because if you cannot compute, you cannot compare to experiment. If you cannot compare to experiment, then you don't have a physical theory. So the real, the real, the real issue that uh, we really want to address in much of the rest of these courses is how to compute Generating functional, or let's say the generating functional, given a theory, slash correlation functions. There are situations, one of which will be discussed today, in which it proves more efficient rather than computing correlation functions and, 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 and explain to you how to compute correlation functions, to first, all in a once, tell you how to compute the generating functional. Because once you have the generating functional, then the problem is solved. You get all the correlation functions. Uh, there are other situations, which we will encounter later on in the course, where really computing the generating functional is a formidable, even numerically formidable effort, and you basically rather go ahead and compute each correlation function by its time. You know, specifically the correlation function you want to, to compute for your specific needs. So that's why I say how to compute generating functions and or directly correlation functions, depending on the need that one might have. Okay, so today we, we demonstrate, we, we provide one important theoretical result, which some of you, specifically those who have taken quantum field theory advanced, or sorry, quantum field the, the first course in quantum field theory, have already encountered, but in a different perspective. So they will re see this uh, in a different framework. And it's called the Vig Theorem. Now, people who are coming from a quantum field theory perspective, and they have learned quantum field theory in the canonical quantization formalism, which is the same formalism we use in quantum mechanics for those who don't have a quantum field theory background. Basically, uh, quantum mechanics, you get position and momenta, from the Hamiltonian, and then you impose commutation relationship between position and momenta, and that's how you basically upgrade position and momenta to operators, quantizing the theory respecting um, uncertainty principle. Now, in quantum field theory, you can do the same. You write the Hamiltonian, you start with the Lagrangian, you get the conjugate momenta, you go to the Hamiltonian, and then you have a Hamiltonian that is defined in terms of fields and its conjugate, just as Q and P in quantum mechanics, and then you impose commutation relationships on the fields. That's how you make quantum field theory. Uh, we are not interested in that in this course. Uh, Albino Perigo, Professor Albino Perigo, in, has, has already covered that material in this course. But from a quantum field theory perspective, the Vick theorem is a statement about 
contractions and time ordering operators and time order correlation functions and oh, I'm sorry Green's functions and, and all that. One of the advantages of the path integral formulation of the path integral quantization is that the Wick theorem is really trivial. Proving the Wick theorem in quantum theory is far from trivial and most textbook I know, most textbooks I know, they give it for granted. Say, so, okay, this is the part we don't prove. That's the big theorem. Buy it. Uh, in quantum theory, in, in any field theory, statistical quantum, defined with the pathetical formalism, the big theorem is actually a statement on how to compute Gaussian integrals over fields. That's it. And the big theorem basically enables you follows from a simple calculation of the generating function R. And we will go through that today. So really, the lecture of today is to compute in Gaussian integrals over fields. Gaussian integrals over fields. So what is a Gaussian integral over fields? Well, in standard calculus, not functional calculus, a Gaussian integral is an integral in the form integral d, well, let's, let's use a black character. So in calculus, and when I calculus, <laughs> calculus, a Gaussian integral is an integral in the type dx exponent and then maybe negative a square x and let me use I can use I'm using explicitly negative for a well let's do this then it's simpler. And the only constraint we have here is that A must be positive if we want to make sure this is a Gaussian integral, a bona fide Gaussian integral. Now, normally, where you're used to thinking Gauss theorem to be in the form integral over dx exponent of negative a x squared, right? That's the Gauss integral we all know and love from statistical physics and from probability theory and blah, blah, blah. However, if you think about it, you can always find a shift of the axis such that you can put this into the form x minus x naught squared. And we're going to go over that. Because that's a parabola, right? And you can and you can shift, translate if you want the axis or your reference frame in order to set your origin and make sure that basically this quadratic form gets into this simpler form. And once you have an integral in the form e to the negative this, then, then you know how to do that, because the integration goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, so it doesn't really matter where the, oxen, where the origin of the x-axis is. This is called completing the square, right? Because typically the way you do it, you add and subtract term to the exponent to the polynomial until you recognize a, per a perfect square. So this constant here depends on a, b, and c. And once you've recognized, and then you'll be left with something else, which is only a constant. So the constant will pop out, out of the integral, and this will be the famous result of standard integration. So that's how you can solve this integral here. So in field theory, or if you want in functional calculus, A Gaussian integral is something quite similar, but slightly more general. 
A Gaussian integral is something in the form d phi e to the negative integral, and so far so good. But then we have like fields, operator fields, and then you might get a linear term. Now you recognize this is the quadratic term, this is the linear term, and I don't really need Sorry, there was a mistake here. I was adding an extra square here. Please go back in your notes and erase that. Of course, that was a typo. There was no extra square here. It's already Gaussian. Otherwise, this exponent would be quartic in x, which of course is not. Everything that I said is correct up to this little two that was appearing right here. And of course, that was a typo. Sorry for interruption. Let's go back here. So there is a clear analogy between what I wrote in this exponent in downstairs and what is written upstairs. Of course, I can add always a constant here, but the constant really doesn't matter because it only does it renormalizes the it factorizes out and normalizes the partition function or generated functional, and it never affects any average. So I can forget about it. But the important difference between the normal calculus and the functional calculus is that now O is not simply a constant. What is this? I'm trying to kill this. O is an operator which could be a differential operator. For instance, it could be something like, uh, I don't know, negative square plus m square. Or it could contain higher order derivatives, if you want. But let's stick to this for the moment. Let's put a 2 here. So, in, in standard calculus, uh, you have only one variable. And therefore, a is just a constant. But you can view, uh, you know, if you perform a lattice discretization of this path integral, then of course fields becomes uh, defined on a grid, on a mesh, and operator become matrices. We already saw that a couple of times, right? When you put things on the lattice, for instance, the the diagonal, the, the second derivative becomes a band diagonal matrix. And therefore, the natural extension of a normal calculus is a multidimensional calculus with uh, uh, indices here, here, and a matrix here. Sorry, it has to refresh the screen. I have indices here telling you which point in the lattice you are. And then you have, in general, a matrix here. And I'm assuming here Einstein notations for simplicity. Now, if you take the continuum limit, then the indices disappear. You get uh, uh, you get continuous variable phi of x, and we are assuming semi-local operator, meaning objects that are local up to derivatives. And this is the case in which the derivatives are lowest, second order derivatives. Now, so now you may ask, let's take, let's consider this very specific quadratic operator here. And let me remind you, there could be higher order derivative operators here, but there could not be higher order powers of fields. Otherwise, this wouldn't be Gaussian. What determines, what is responsible for the Gaussianity of this path integral is the powers of fields in the experiment, not the power of derivatives in the exponent. Now, Gaussian field, Gaussian theories, like the one that I define here, correspond to different physical contents, whether we are looking at a statistical field theory or a quantum field theory. So those of you who have taken uh, quantum field theory, they know that the Hamiltonian in terms of fields 
for Klein Gordon contains a term which is very likely very like in this form. Or stated differently, maybe it's a probably more transparent if I look at the Lagrangian density. Right. Now really I'm looking here at Lagrangian density in Euclidean space, so this is really Euclidean Lagrangian density rather than a standard Lagrangian density after you have made the weak transformation just to make the analogy with uh, statistical theory more transparent and you have a very similar structure with the only difference that you have a the Lambertian rather than a Laplacian but other than that uh, so, so if you think about my statistical field theory representing a scalar field theory in Euclidean time, in n dimension, then a Gaussian field theory is nothing but uh, a free theory. On the other hand, if you are interested in a uh, bona fide statistical field theory, in other words, in my fields now represent not the weak rotation of quantum fields, but really, really they represent uh, some spin theory, like some averages and stuff. Then now, uh, my Gaussian fields are actually meaning something different. They are meaning uh, fields in which the correlations between different regions of the fields, the fields in different regions, is short range. And in particular, if I have a lowest order derivative, in this case second order derivative, the correlation is near neighbor. If I have larger order derivatives, you can extend the correlation to next to neighboring lattice sites. Remember? And therefore, basically, you have that for statistical fields which represent really like uh, say spins or similar degrees of freedom then Gaussian integral is a nearest neighbor type of, or short range type of correlation paramagnetic type of correlation so to say yeah I would say paramagnetic type is the most general way of defining this all right I think this is um, this is more or less uh, general. So let's go ahead and see how can you complete the square with fields so that you can solve uh, Gaussian integrals. Now in the presence of operation of operators uh, it is not as trivial as in the case of C normal calculus to add and subtract terms in order to make this a perfect square. So the idea is always the same, right? You want to make this something like uh, something you can compute. So, uh, to, to use the fact, that, so, so, you know, really, the, the whole point is to make this a perfect square. Just as we did in, in normal calculus. But now we have a problem that we have an operator sitting here. No longer a number. So, just adding and subtracting constants uh, won't work won't make it, won't save the day. We have to be a little bit more clever. And, uh, but it's a fun game to do, so let's do it. So let me begin by defining the Green's functions of an operator. So we all know this probably, but let's suppose we have a differential operator, O. This is Typically, let me denote it with OX for reminding myself that it might contain derivatives with respect to X. Potentially also some external fields, but in, evaluated in X. But, uh, but let's not worry about that at the moment. Because that would make things enormously more complicated. Uh, so, Green's function...
Well, that's considered. Yeah, I'm assuming situation where they have uh, homogeneous homogeneity. Uh, well, I don't necessarily. Well, let's let's stick to the simplest case. Well, the Green's function is nothing but the inverse of the operator, right? Uh, we know that from electrostatics. When we looked at the Coulomb Green's function as the inverse of the D'Alembert of the Laplace operator for electrostatics, and remember, once you have the Green's functions, then you can solve uh, differential operate differential equations with a source term by making a convolution. And we use that already in our solution of stochastic problems. So that's that's what we know. Okay, so now let's go back and do an evaluation of my. That's what we want to compute. Now let's see if I want to use I want to I want to use the same notation uh, that I did in my previous course. Yeah, I use the notation W. Yeah, so just for making sure that I'm using the same notation as I did in the lecture, let's call W. half equal half. Oh, so with this notation I will substitute here and put the W half. For a simple reason that when you have a scalar field theory you always have one half by default there for matter of simplicity for keeping formula simple. Of course you can always multiply your fields by one over root of two, right? So this will amount to a finite Jacobian that will enter outside will appear only here as a multiplicative constant, so has no physical effect whatsoever. So the two theories are the same theory, just are slightly changing the variables in which they are defined. Okay, so that's our goal. We want to compute this guy. Okay, welcome back. I had to sort of uh, interrupt the lecture because I discovered there was a, a mistake, a stupid typo in my notes. So I was uh, I was worried that I had to fix it, and I will upload the corrected notes. Also, please note that I have disappeared for the screen because the rest of this lecture is going to be a little bit of lengthy calculations, and I don't want to be part of it and take space. So let me go fast and tell you that what we were interested in was evaluating the generating functional. in the following form. Okay, and remember, we chose H0 to be a quadratic functional, and with the notation that I adopted at the end of the lecture, I will use this to be defined in this way, where this is a differential operator with derivative axis with respect to x. So now, to match the two notations, you, you might think about this in terms of dx, phi of x, o, phi of x. Now the reason I pulled off a factor one half is that as you will see it will make calculation easier you get rid of factors two floating around. In addition to that I have uh, defined or I uh, don't remember if I have already but I will do now the Green's function of the W operator which will come handy in a minute. Now for instance if W is the usual negative square plus m operator, which means that O is the usual negative Laplacian plus m square operator. This is the example we are considering, right? Now, in this simple case, then you know you can compute this uh, delta by going to Fourier space as usual, in which case this will become p squared, remember? 
and then you Fourier transform the data, it will give you a constant, which means that in this representation, five of x will be integral d. Now I explicitly put the dimension because there is a two pi to the number of dimension down here, and then we get the Fourier p dot x of the Fourier transform of the sky, which is one over p square plus m square. Now what the result of this depends on the number of dimension, d equals 2, d equals 3, d equals 4, and blah, blah, blah. You get different results for this. Uh, in the specific case in which d is equal to 3, which is the kind of examples we are interested in today, this will be 1 over 4 pi Yukawa term. Okay, now, we want to compute the square, complete the square, and basically we want to get rid of the linear factor. That's, that's, that's what we want to do, right? Because if you can get rid of the linear factor, then everything else is nicely purely Gaussian. And that's the trick. So the way we do that, we shift variables, which means that we use the transformation phi of x, goes into phi of x negative and then we want to put a value alpha why do we do this specific transformation well it will become clear in a minute why shifting by an amount that depends on j and delta well, the fact that the shifting depends on j is quite expected because we want to cancel out a piece that depends on j, so we want the j to be part of the shifting. The reason we use delta is also quite uh, simple to guess, but uh, we will clearly see in a minute, so I won't spend time on it. And alpha, insofar, is an unspecified parameter, and we will fix it at the end so that we can make sure that we choose precisely the value of the alpha that makes this ugly term here disappear. So, you know, this is the part that will become clear in a minute. Now, when you do this shift, in principle, you can affect the integrate. You have a Jacobian, and then you have a change in the integrand. But clearly, we don't have a change in the Jacobian because the Jacobian of a standard shift is, is trivial. Even if there was like a constant in here, the Jacobian would be a constant, which wouldn't matter for the partition function, for the generating function. But even more so if the shift uh, is it's just a simple translation of uh, field variables, right? So we don't have to worry about the Jacobian. But we do have to worry about how these two terms transform under this shift. So let's look at how the h naught of phi transforms under the field shifting. Well, when I compute the field shifting, I generate four terms, right? Because I get like this, let's call it A and B, and I will get terms in, ter in the form A, W, A, A, W, B, B, W, A, B, W, B in here. So four terms. Let's look what they look like. Well, let's look at A, W, A. This will be one half integral dx phi of x w phi of x, obviously. So basically, A, the A, W, A is simply H naught. I don't have to worry with it. Now let's look at the two cross terms. I will get a term like plus one half integral dx integral dy delta of x minus y j of y w phi of x. I will get another term and I guess I'm forgetting a negative sign and an alpha here. Coming from this negative sign and this alpha. I'll get another negative sign and alpha for the other terms integral and dx integral in dy, phi of x, w, delta of x, minus y, j of y. And finally, I get my 
dwb term, which is going to be this time alpha squared, integral dx, integral dy, now I get another one, integral dz, and I get delta of x minus y j of y, w, delta of x minus z, j of z. And that's it, these are four terms. One, two, three, four, ops. One, two, three, four terms. Now, you immediately see why we chose this very structure here. We chose to shift by an amount that depends on the inverse of the W operator. Because you see, already here, I get W acting on its inverse in an operational cells, on its Green's function. So when I do that, this is really delta of x minus y. Likewise, when W acts here, I get again delta of x minus z. Now, the slightly less trivial term is the one in which is this one. It's less trivial because, in principle, W acts on the right. However, now we use the fact that W actually enters the definition of a Hamiltonian, and by construction, a Hamiltonian must be defined in terms of an emission operator. Otherwise, if the emission operator, if this was not an emission operator, then obviously its eigenvalues wouldn't be real, and 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 wouldn't make sense in terms of physical theory. But if it's an emission operator, it means that you can act on the left or on the right as a well. So that's one. So if you want quantum mechanically inspired uh, or motivated explanation why I can have W acting on the left, a mathematical version of it is. My W must contain an even number of uh, derivatives, even order derivatives. Uh, we arrive to that by assuming space transla uh, translational invariance. So I have to have scalars, and you can only have scalars if I have an even number of derivatives. And if I have an even number of derivatives, I can act an even number of integration by parts. Anytime I integrate twice or four times by parts, I act on the left. Right, rather on the right, and any time I switch the derivative acting from the left on the right, I get a negative sign, but since I do it in an even number of time, I get the same result. So here you have two different ways of seeing why you can have this W operator acting on the left and not on the right. So once again, rather than this, I can get delta of x minus y. Now, after I remove all the unnecessary integrals, now I have delta functions, I get a term here that looks like integral in dx, j of x, phi of x. Here I get a term that integrals that looks like integral in dx, j of x, phi of x. So all I'm doing is basically removing the half, the half here. And in the last term, I get a slightly different integral. I can remove the integral over z, for instance, and I get j of z, j of x. So, combining all terms together, I get my h naught will be will go into itself plus a linear terms in the source plus a quadratic term in the source j of x delta of x minus y, j of y. Very cool. And this is really, 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 really interesting. Why is it interesting? Because you see now, magically, I have made appear a term that looks exactly like the one that I want to cancel. So by choosing alpha properly, I can get rid of the linear term, which is precisely why we're doing all this calculation. So now, before we choose alpha, let's uh, look at what happens to this linear term under transformation. So the integral dx, phi of x, j of x, we go into itself once again. 
and then I will get a term which is this time linear and will be negative Oh, sorry, I get a half here. Sorry. If you go back, there was a half missing. Oh, shit. I... I, I ah! Okay, I need to rewrite this. I think it was a negative alpha. Yes, 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 yes. J of x, 5x. No, J of x, delta, 5x. Now, the source term, meaning integral dx, phi of x, J of x, will go into itself. And a term which this time will be linear in the field, so we got something like minus alpha integral dx dy j delta j. Same structure as this. So if I combine things together, now all I want to do is to make sure that after I do the transformation, this term will cancel exactly with this term. So clearly, to have the linear term disappear, my alpha must be chosen to be equal to 1. If I choose alpha is equal to 1, then these two terms go away. This term becomes 1 half, and this term becomes 1. Now remember, the Hamiltonian comes in the exponent with a negative sign, so does the source term. So in the end, my partition function, and I write it in a different color, will look like e to the one half integral dx integral dy j of x delta of x minus y j of y times the partition function that collects all the terms where the source terms have disappeared. This and this. Sorry, this one. So times integral dx e to the negative h of phi, which is nothing but the partition function in the absence of any field, external field. Now, on the one hand, you may say, I haven't computed any partition function because it's still here. So I haven't done any step forward. But, but in fact, we have because we have pulled out of the integral the only part that depends on the source terms. And remember, when I want to compute correlation functions, which all I needed to do physics, I want to do a differential, a functional differentiation with respect to the source terms. And I don't care about anything that doesn't depend on the source term because that doesn't contribute and it cancels out from numerator and denominator. So state it differently, I can divide this guy by z of naught. And basically all I need to do calculation is this guy. I want to emphasize this result, which is kind of non-trivial. We express the partition functions for a generic source term as a constant term which doesn't depend on the source times a specific term that depends on the source through correlation functions, through Green's function. Now, remember the recipe. Correlation functions are associated to functional derivative with respect to the source term divided by the partition function and then eventually set partition function to zero. I have a number of derivatives here. 
This means that I don't really need to compute this guy. I really don't care because it will cancel out from numerator and denominator. And all I really need to know is this part here. So really what I can do is that my partition function is a constant as is in terms of a functional dependence on the sources times this guy. And now I can simply act on derivatives of this guy because this is just a Gaussian. It's, a, it's an exponent and I, it's, it's analytic and trivial to differentiate it with respect to the, trivial, to the source. So in the next lecture, I will provide some example on how to do this and compute some correlation functions and see that this is basically nothing but the weak theorem. But this is not clear at this point yet. In the next lecture, you'll see how you get correlation functions that look like contractions and things you learn from quantum theory, for those who have. For us, big theory is just a strategic way to compute correlation functions. And we have everything we need from this expression to get all the correlation functions we want in this theory by function and differentiation. This simple, closed, analytic function form. Okay, see you next lecture.